Buenos dias. Bonjour. Let's say, guten tag, guten tag. Goedemiddag. You weren't ready for that one. Let's see. Um, salam. Shalom. Ohio, Ohio, gozaimasu. Although we're not in the morning anymore. So, konnichiwa. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is always tough to speak at lunch. I'm competing with good food. Um, but I am really excited to be here, and I'm excited to be around so many friends. Um, just coming in last night, I ran into people, right, like as my husband and I were coming up from the parking lot, and he's like, is there anyone you don't know? So, well, there are a few, there are a few. Um, but thank you for, for all the greetings. Um, I've spoken in this space many times for different things, and it's just exciting to be here. I think what's also fabulous is this will be the sixth time that I have spoken after Northwest Tap. So, I love them. They give me life. If I could dance like that, I would. I'm not going to do that for you because that's, I, I love to dance, but I'm not good like that. So, we're not doing that for you today. Um, but I do, they gave me energy. They are fabulous. So, if you want them in your school, please just go to their website. Have them come to your school district. And um, I've seen them in, in Bellevue and Issaquah and all, just all over the state. They are phenomenal. And their leader is actually being awarded in a couple of weeks for lifetime service. Um, so you got an incredible treat. She is a gift to this community. So today I am going to talk about uh, moving from diversity to equity. And some of you have, have heard my story before. Some of you have heard me talk, do a similar talk to this uh, before because I've been in many of your districts. I think I opened five or six of your districts this year. So I've seen quite a few of you recently. Yeah, right here. The other Aaron is up here, right? He's the cheering squad right up here, Bremerton School District. So I love y'all. Um, but I've seen a lot of you around. I never tell the same story twice. So if you've already heard me, you're going to hear some new stories today. And so I'm really excited about that. But I do want to start um, with an activity. And I, I, if we had the space, I'd get in a circle. And have you get in a circle? We're not going to get in a circle today. Because I don't think that's possible in here. But I want you to imagine a circle. And um, when I do training, I always start with this activity. So I just want you to imagine physically a circle. A circle has no sides to it. There are no corners. A circle is inclusive. A circle, there's no leader. Everyone is the same distance from the center. If we were in a circle, we could all see each other. Now, one of the things that I did this morning, I, I, am a, a four, I played basketball for 40 years. So at, at 45, when I ran for office, I decided all of this was just too much. So now I run and I walk. Um, and so before I spoke this morning, I walked three miles. I got 10,000 steps in before noon today. 10,000 steps. But I walked and I listened to John's message from yesterday. Now, by the way, your three keynote speakers are all really good friends. They did not know this when they asked us to speak. And we all looked at the list and we're like, wait. Actually, we all work for Character Strong, all three of us. So um, you're going to hear some stuff. So where's your Webby? Show me your Webby, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. This is your pop quiz. OK, awesome. Number crunchers. You remember number crunchers? OK, uh, OK. We may do that a little bit later. Um, so I listened to his speech from yesterday. You may hear some stuff. I, I may do a little pop quiz somewhere in the middle of my talk today about that. Um, but it's awesome that you got to hear John yesterday, me today, and Robert Hand tomorrow. You're Washington State Teacher of the Year, whose school I'm speaking at in six weeks. So the three of us really are great friends. And you will see a through line around connecting, not because they told us to talk about connecting, but because this is who we are. John and I and Robert all believe that the foundation of anything good that happens in the world, education, leadership, period, is connecting. It's relationships. And so you'll hear a through line of that through all of our talks. But today, I want to start with this circle activity. And what's really important to me right now in this time and this season in our country, especially with young people, and John talked about this a little bit yesterday, we got a bunch of kids who are on phones, and some of y'all who are on phones, like this, 80% of your day. And guess what? That is not relationship. 
That is not relationship. And I tell people, I have about 20,000 people that follow me on social media. You cannot know me until you know me. You can't know me by following me on Facebook because I only get to show you a snapshot of my journey. But how many of our students, because they got 150 likes on a picture, think they are known? And they're really not. How many of you post something on LinkedIn and you're upset when you only got two likes? Right? We we fall prey to that as well. And that's because that's not where relationships should be coming from. That's not where esteem comes from. And so why is the circle so important to me? Because we've got to be facing each other. We have to know each other. We can't look at a screen and know one another. We've got to look at each other in the face. And most of my work is around racial equity. Talking about stuff Washingtonians don't want to talk about race. That's what I get to talk about. And lots of times in all white spaces, me, six feet tall with a big red afro. And if you think that's comfortable, you got another thing coming. It is not comfortable standing in front of mostly white audiences talking about race. But I do it because I believe in the connection And I believe there are conversations we need to have if we're going to become our best selves, and they can't happen on social media. They've got to happen in relationship. And so I'm going to model that a little bit with this activity. And by the way, if you want this activity, I give it away. Um, I'm just going to read a number of statements. And if you could raise your hand for each statement that's true for you, look around the room. Imagine that we're in a circle. Look around the room. Don't watch me. Look around the room. See who else's hands are raised. And then put your hand down. First statement, raise your hand if you've ever had a pet. Raise your hand if you live in a house. Raise your hand if you are an only child. Raise your hand if you have lived in the same city for at least five years. Raise your hand if you have lost a family member or a family friend to some form of cancer. Raise your hand if you lived as a child with both your biological mother and biological father. Raise your hand if you know someone who's an alcoholic. Raise your hand if you planned as a middle school student to attend college after you graduated from high school. Raise your hand if you've traveled outside of this state for a vacation. Raise your hand if you've ever played on a sports team. Raise your hand if you have at least one living grandparent. Raise your hand if you have ever traveled outside of the United States. Raise your hand if you have more than three brothers and sisters. Raise your hand if you've been to see a movie in the theater, not on Netflix, in the last three weeks. Raise your hand if you've ever been to the principal's office. I did not say because you were bad. Yeah, I knew there were some of you goody two-shoes out there. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever met someone famous. Raise your hand if you worked a minimum wage job at any point after high school. Raise your hand if you've read at least part of a book in the last two months. So I hope you saw how many people had things in common. Now, raise your hand if you think, if I were to do this in South Chicago, the answers would be pretty different. Raise your hand if you think the answers in South Chicago, maybe you've never been to South Chicago. Um, let's, Let's try East LA. Raise your hand if you think the answers in East LA would be pretty significantly different. Okay. Do I have anybody here from Prosser? Any Prosser people? Oh, okay. So I did this in Spanish with folks who worked, were migrant laborers in process. So Spanish is one of the languages that I speak. 
How many of you think the answers would be pretty different from yours if I did this with migrant laborers in Prosser? Raise your hand. So here's what's crazy. I have done it with migrant laborers in Prosser. I've done it in East LA, in Chicago. I've done it in DC, in Houston, in Dallas, Spokane. 85 to 90% of the answers are exactly the same no matter where I do it. Here's why I always start with this activity, because I think we tend to look at people and where they live and what their skin color is and assume they are much more different from us than they actually are. And I believe if we're really going to do this work of equity, we have to first find the common. We have to find common ground. We have to find our similarities as humans because that's the way you build a bridge to the difficult conversations that need to happen. If you have no common ground, there's no trust. And if there's no trust, then we can't go deep. We're going to have this superficial conversation. And so I'm going to ask you today to be treasure hunters. As we think about equity, are you willing to be a treasure hunter? Are you willing to dig for treasure in that person that's sitting next to you or across from you who looks different from you? Are you willing to find the common ground? Are you willing to connect? That's what this is about. And it's not about some light connection. You know, I'm going to start following you on Twitter. It's that deep. Are you willing to go out for coffee and really listen to their story? Listen to the pain, the success? Because guess what? We've all had it. All of us have struggled at some point. All of us who are in this room have also had success at some point or we wouldn't be here. Are you willing to dig for that treasure and the people around you? Because that's the bridge across which we're going to find our best selves. But without the connection, we can't get there. And I think that's where we've been stuck. We've been trying to find connection in ways that really aren't very authentic and aren't very useful. And so I, before I put up this next slide, I want to ask you to talk about three words at your table. And they are three words that get thrown around in education all the time. We love some buzzwords in education. And so here are the three words. I'm going to give you two minutes at your table to talk to a partner at your table about what you think these words mean. If you don't know one of the words, that's absolutely fine. But um, I want you to talk about what you think they mean. Diversity is word number one. Culturally responsive practice, word number two. Equity, word number three. So diversity, word number one. Culturally responsive practice and equity. And we're not talking about home equity. You're in the wrong place if that's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, but I want you to take two minutes at your table with the partner to talk about what do you think diversity and think about the context of education. Diversity, culturally responsive practice, equity. Turn and talk. One more minute, one more minute. Thirty seconds.
five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So I am, I'm an academic in that I've spent almost 30 years now working in schools, but I don't like super academic terminology because I don't think it's practical. So I'm gonna put up here how I think about, and I know for some of you this is really small. If you want the slides, you can have them later. I talk about diversity as wanting to acknowledge and possibly celebrate the differences between people. It's typically focused on compliance or the superficial ways people are different. Now here's where diversity catches us. Diversity is, we're gonna do an MLK assembly to recognize the black people in our school or the black people in our country, and that's it. They should just be happy with their one day. By the way, MLK is a black man who happens to be an American. That's why he was honored, not because he was black, but because he was an American hero. And if that's all you're gonna do is the one day check, that is called diversity. Now I'm gonna step on some toes here, but I need you to hear me with the right heart. It is also things like acknowledging the land that we're standing on without doing anything to support our Native American folks. That may step on some toes. It's stuff like having a, a, I know Hispanic Awareness Month, I think was last month. It's, it's like that, but never getting to hear anything about the, contribution, the contributions of our Latinx community any other time of the year. It's that stuff, and I'm not saying don't do that, but if that's all you're doing, that is compliance and it's checking a box. That's diversity. Now, culturally responsive practice is the ability to learn from and relate respectfully with people of your own culture as well as those from different cultures. And, and what that means is you gotta do your own self work too. You cannot appreciate someone else's culture if you've never unpacked your own. And there are a lot of y'all in this room who have never unpacked your own. Cause you haven't had to, cause you swim in it every day. It's like asking a fish to describe the water, asking us to describe air. Some of y'all, have been swimming in the culture that works for you your entire life, and you've never had to think about your own culture. And by the way, culture and race are not the same thing. Oh, you can clap, that's okay, that's okay. You can clap. So by the way, you can't look at me and assume my culture. You can't look at a person, and for example, I can't look at an Asian person and assume that all Asian, like from the continent of Asia. When people ask me, do you like Asian food? I'm like, what, what kind of question is that? I love Thai food, I love, it's not all one food. But we do that, we, we swipe the whole thing. But until you have unpacked your own culture and understand how you work and the values that you have, you really can't understand someone else's. And guess what, all, all cultures are flawed. Every last culture is flawed. But we gotta embrace and own how we move through the world in order to embrace and own and value the experiences of others. But here's what I'm gonna suggest. If we just stop there, that isn't actually equity. Because I can celebrate and value a bunch of different cultures. I can hang, hang flags in the hallway at my school. But if nothing changes about systems, that is not equity. Here's what equity is. Equity is disrupting systems that need to be disrupted. It is creating supports and providing resources and it's tearing down things that are hurting kids and staff. So we often talk about equity as just the students, but I'm gonna give you an example. I had two teachers, um, I was in Tacoma this week. I went back to my old school. I taught at Stewart, I taught French immersion at Stewart Middle School. French immersion is every subject. I had my babies five hours of the day at middle school. Five hours with sixth graders. I taught them with not a word of English. Kids who'd never heard French before, by the way. I taught them language, math, science, history, and PE in French. I was tired after three years. That was a lot of work. Um, but I was just visiting there um, on Thursday. I spent half a day at my old building because one of my students that you will see in a picture later, 
has, is doing his administrative internship there, and I had a day off. So on my day off, I went to hang out with my former student at his school. And there was a teacher there in a hallway as I walked by, and she said, Aaron, oh my gosh, I read your stuff on social media, and you just put a post about teaching. She said, do you know, as an adult, I get called names sometimes. There are ways that I don't get to experience equity. And I so appreciate that you're talking about the adult piece of this, too. And so if we're just looking at students who are missing an opportunity to support the adults that are serving our students. So we've got to be thinking about not just survival. I don't like talking about surviving. I want, I want to thrive. I personally want to thrive, and I want all of my staff to thrive, and I want every student to thrive. I don't want them to just get through from one day to the next. And I think way too many of our teachers are just getting through because we haven't thought about what does it mean to support an educator to thrive. And so these are three terms, um, diversity, culturally responsive practice, and equity, that I think we need to understand. And I'm going to push us to get to equity. And what that means is systems. And so here's how I think about, oh, actually, you know, we're going to do this. I want you to turn and talk for two minutes at your table with the partner about where have you seen the transition? If you've been in school spaces for more than the last 10 years, you have seen us as a state and us as a nation transition from just talking about diversity to this equity thing. I want you to have a conversation about that. Has your district moved to e at least thinking about equity? I think most districts are, are using equity as compliance right now, if we're real. We, we haven't gone deep yet. That's okay, we gotta start somewhere. But I want you to talk about your, the transition in your own space, in your district, in your life. Where have you seen diversity talked about? Have you even heard about culturally responsive practice? And where are you touching at equity? So turn and talk for two minutes with somebody at your table, groups of no more than three. One more minute. Thirty seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. If you, if you come to my workshop after this, I'm going to break this down a little bit more um, in depth, but I, I want to give you circles, much like John talked about yesterday. I believe equity is that the center of myself, my personal story, how do I come into education? What were my personal experiences in education? Because we all bring them, whether you're a school board member or you're a superintendent, 
you're a parent, whatever your role is in this space today, you all bring your personal story into the space, how you experience school, whether it worked for you or didn't. And to deny your personal story, you're never going to be able to get to equity. So you've got to unpack your personal story. It's yourself, it's our students, and it's systems. Equity is at the nexus of those three things. Understanding your own personal story, understanding the stories of your students, and then understanding what are the systems and policies and practices that are at play. And so when I do my session next after this, I'm going to break these down. But you have to know your own personal story. And for too many of us, well, I'm going to say you, because I, I get to unpack my story every day around this stuff. But too many of you have just come into the space and school has worked for you. And so now you serve to support other students, but it doesn't work for everybody the same way it worked for you. And if you're not willing to unpack that and get real about your own story, we're never going to get to equity. But also, if you're not willing to do the work of knowing the people who are not on your board, when I look out at this room, we do not represent all of the students we serve, right? And so what that means is don't clap yet. What that means is your work board members and superintendents is you got to figure out who are the voices that are not at this table and how do we get them at this table? How do we at least go to them and make sure we're hearing their voices? Because if you are making decisions on their behalf, I can promise you, you are not making good decisions for them. You can't make decisions for people you don't know. You can't make decisions for people whose homes you've never visited. You need to understand their cultural experience, their school experience as well. But here's the other thing. If you're not willing to look at systems, you're never going to get to equity. So you can know your own personal story really well. You can know the stories of your kids. But if you are not willing to look at who gets into special education, who gets into advanced programs, who goes to college and stays there and is successful, who has access to after school programs and can actually go to them, because you have transportation for them, who has food at home. If you have not unpacked systems, you cannot say that you're doing equity work. And that's why we can't stop at diversity. We can't stop at culturally responsive practice. We've got to go all the way deep into systems. And guess what? Unpacking systems is hard work because systems have been around a long time and they've been working for y'all for a long time. But for many of the students who are not represented in this room, and I'm, just, I'm not just talking about color here. I'm talking about all of our marginalized groups of kids. Often their families do not get a seat at the table. And so we're not even aware sometimes. We have really good intention. We think we're doing good work for them. But we're not even aware sometimes of where our policy and practice is bumping up against some students and causing them to really struggle. And so I will be unpacking these things in my session today, but I want to, kind of the meat of today for me is to share my why, unpack my own self story, because what you see is not at all what you get. I am a walking disruption of narratives. When I walk through stores, uh, you know, people often ask me on planes and in airports and wherever I am, are you a basketball player? Well, yeah, I am, and I speak four languages fluently, and... Don't assume because I'm a tall black lady I play basketball because my six foot four son doesn't want to get anywhere near a basketball court. But we tell people stories before we even get to know them. This is what we do as human beings. And so I love to share a piece of my story because it is not at all what you think and what you see. And so I was born um, June 3rd, 1971. I am excited about the coming 50. I'm excited about this. I've got a year and a half to go, but I'm actually really excited. I feel like I'm in my best years of life right now. Um, but I was born in 1971. Why is that important? Because until 1968, it was actually illegal for my parents to be together. Because my mother was white and my father was black in Minnesota. Minnesota. Now, if you've never been to Minnesota, there are not a lot of us there. And when my mom found out she was pregnant with a little black baby, she was told by her family, you cannot keep this child. And abortion did not become legal until 1972. So mother would carry me to term and 
leave me in the hospital. And I literally started my first day of life at the Children's Home Society. Except I was one of the lucky few. About 90% of black babies in the state of Minnesota to this day don't ever get adopted. But one day, this couple would walk in, and they are white people. And I, I joke all the time, my daddy's so white, by this time of year, he's clear. <laughs> like, he's, you can see his veins coming through his skin like he is. He is clear, OK? Like, he is Norwegian. And um, he needs some sun. But my parents would choose to adopt babies no one wanted in Minnesota at the time as black babies. And so they would walk into the Children's Home Society and say, who are the babies nobody wants? Well, the black babies. And my mom and dad would get a tour through the nursery, and they saw my crib and said, we want her. I was chosen by a family. I think that's kind of incredible, actually. <laughs> but the tough part is the community and my parents' parents were not so excited about this. And so... If you see the pictures on the screen of my, my family, you only see my dad's side of the family because that side of the family absolutely received me. I am, um, my dad has one brother, he has three sons. We are all six feet taller, taller. We are all basketball players, we are all teachers, and we all sing. Kind of cool. I don't believe in accidents. Um, and in fact, we're all part of the same church denomination, too, even though our parents are not. I don't know how that happens. But um, you don't see pictures of my mom's side of the family because things are not so smooth with my mom's side of the family. And um, I just started telling this story about two years ago. Um, I don't ever tell stories that will make me cry on a stage in front of people I don't know. Just if you're a public speaker, that's just my rule. I just don't tell stories that will make me cry because it's just embarrassing. But I, um, when I was nine years old, my, mother, my mother's mother would pass away. She had pneumonia, and she went from being in the hospital to dead in about three weeks, really quick. And about three weeks after she died, my grandfather would call my mom and say, Dorothy, I'm getting remarried to the organist from your mom's funeral. Three weeks. This is what happens in small town Minnesota. When you go to the same church and you both have lost a spouse and grandfather does not know how to cook and she is a, had been married to a millionaire and didn't know how to pay bills. So they're like, well, we must just get married, right? So this is what happened. And, um, and so my mom's like, yeah, we're not coming to the wedding. This is not happening. So we didn't go to the wedding, but we were invited to Christmas that year. And my parents, because of how they were treated in this country, when I was five, had moved us to the Netherlands. So I did all of my schooling at the American School of the Hague. So we were living in the Netherlands at the time. And um, grandma, our new grandma invites us for Christmas. So we fly all the way back to the States and drive the four hours from Twin Cities Airport up to tiny town, northern Minnesota. She has this beautiful mansion on the side of a lake. And when we come in the front door, we're informed that there are 16 other grandchildren. And so we went from being four of us total to 16 overnight. And um, guess what? Little kids don't care about skin color. And so we all played together. All 18 of us played together. And then it was time to line up at the tree for Christmas presents. Now, remember, I said Grandma was a millionaire. So what were we excited about? <laughs> My parents were teachers. We got socks and T-shirts for Christmas. So we were excited about Millionaire Grandma and Christmas presents. And my brother and I are the youngest, so we're first in line. And Grandma goes under the tree, and she has this big, beautifully wrapped gift. And she passes my brother, and she passes me. And she gives a gift to the next kid. And at first, I'm thinking, oh, we're good. You know, I can be patient. She just has them out of order. And she passes my brother and passes me and passes my brother and passes me. And after she'd passed us about five or six times, I watched as my mom grabbed my dad's hand and took her out of the room. And I was like, oh, I can be patient. We can wait for millionaire grandma presents. Thank you very much. And she passes us another five or six times. And I realized at nine years old, we are not getting Christmas today. 
And I grab my brother's hand, and we go through the house looking for my mom and dad, and, and I can hear my mother crying in the kitchen. So we run to the kitchen, and my dad is holding her in his arms, and he hears me and says, Aaron, you take your brother out to the car now. Now, it is Minnesota on Christmas Day. <laughs> it's northern Minnesota on Christmas Day. It's about negative 20 degrees outside. And I was like, Daddy, we're going to die out there. Take your brother out to the car. And so I do. And we sit in the car. We're going to die. And we didn't get any Christmas presents. <laughs> and Mom and Dad get into the car about 10 minutes later. And I don't know how many, any Scandinavians in here? OK, so you all know this. There are certain things that Scandinavian families don't talk to children about, right? It's just the adults. So my parents would get into the car, and they would never speak of grandma and grandpa. And to this day, we have never spoken of grandma and grandpa again. We would never go visit them. Their names remained unspoken. Flash forward 20 years, almost. I am 28 years old, and we're living in Tacoma. We had just moved here after graduate school. My husband is a Tacoma boy. He is, by the way, the younger brother, younger, bigger brother of Jesse Jones, Cairo News. <laughs> so anytime you see Jesse, just imagine the larger version. That's who I'm married to. Um, but we just moved to Tacoma. And one day, there's a knock on the door. And it is my sister-in-law, Jesse and James, used to have a little sister. And she was involved in the Hilltop Crips. And she was involved in kind of that lifestyle. And even when she got out of the crib, she still was living that lifestyle. And she had a two-year-old little girl in her arms. And she said, Erin, you're a stay-at-home mom right now. Um, I just, I need to get my life straight. Can you keep my daughter for a little while? She would never come back. And that's a longer story. But um, at the time, so now I have a one-year-old, a two-year-old, and a three-year-old. She is born the same day as my younger son, one, two, and three. And I had been playing in a men's basketball league in, in Tacoma at the time, and my boys knew how to do basketball because I literally played till the day before I delivered each of them. And then I played again when they were three weeks old. So like, I, there's ballers and there's basketball players. Okay, like I was serious about some basketball. And I got out on the court and she would scream bloody murder every time I left the bench because her mom used to leave her in the house. She would say, I'm going to the bathroom, and she would leave. And so every time I left the bench, she thought I was leaving her. And I realized in that first game, I got to take a break from basketball. This little girl needs me home with her. So I took a year off of basketball and just took care of my three kids. And at the end of the year, my phone rings. Aaron Jones, yes, this is the Seattle storm. OK, why? We'd like to offer you a tryout. Now, what I should have said is I have not touched a basketball for a year. I'm about to be 29, and I have three little kids. But instead, what came out of my mouth is winter tryouts. <laughs> I like to do hard things. I like to do hard things. And so she said three in three months. And I said, OK, I'll be there. Click. Like, what was I thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. And then my mother-in-law calls, that I think the next day, and she says, Aaron. I had the weirdest dream last night. I know that you're a stay-at-home mom, but I had this dream that I'm supposed to come live with you and take care of the kids. <laughs> oh, I think we're trying out for the WNBA. I think this is happening. <laughs> and so I began to train, and I trained at the downtown YMCA. Where are my YMCA people? I saw you here somewhere. Oh, there they are. So I trained at the downtown YMCA with Charlie and Phil. And I was there six days a week, six hours a day on my own. Now, I played Division Three basketball, so we didn't even have a weight room at my college. I didn't know how to do all that stuff. I just knew I needed to be running and playing a lot of basketball, so that's what I did. And one day, I'm shooting free throws in the gym all by myself, and there, this giant human being shows up in the corner. And I can see him in my peripheral vision, but I'm trying to stay focused on my form. But there is a giant human, and I can feel his eyes boring into my head. And I turned and I said, sir, you're creeping me out. And he said, well, Aaron. He said, I've been watching you for the last hour. He said, both of the managers of this YMCA called me and told me your husband's a pastor. He's making about $30,000 a year. You have three little kids and a mother-in-law living with you. And you've got to try out for the WNBA. He said, I'm a professional coach of female athletes. 
Are you interested in a free coach? Uh, yes, we'll take free. We'll take free. Yeah. And so I began to train with him. And we trained together and we trained together. And about a week before tryouts, he, he calls all of us together and he says, ladies, I think I got us a second tryout for the Portland Fire. Are you interested in a second tryout? And I'm like, sure. I worked this hard to get here. Might as well have two tryouts. Now, I didn't think this through because the tryout for Seattle was on a Friday for six hours. The tryout for Portland was on Saturday. I don't know if you've ever driven the I-5 quarter on a Friday. I am six feet tall, sitting in a car for four hours after running for six hours is not fun. So we get down to Portland after our first tryout, and I get to lunchtime, and there are muscles that hurt that I did not even know existed. And I'm like, I just want to die right now. Can I just quit now? Like, I am too old for this. I love basketball. Not like this, though. And then I said to myself, you know what? I can do anything for three more hours. I'm going to push through this to the very end, and I do. And I literally am laid out on the floor after the last buzzer rings. And there's a camera and a voice. Aaron Jones, yes, this is NBA Live. Why? <laughs> I'm not tired, OK? I got nothing left. And he says, whoa. You're the oldest woman with the most children at WNBA tryouts. We'd like to do an interview. <laughs> so that's uh, how I made NBA Live for being old with a lot of kids. But when he was done interviewing me, there was a tiny little uh, woman waiting behind him. And she said, Aaron, I've been watching you all day. And I was like, I'm sorry, that was not pretty. I'm so sorry. And she said, no, it was actually beautiful. She said, I watched you from the moment you walked in. You helped the younger girls get to where they needed to go. She said, every time someone missed a shot or they missed a block, you would say to them, come on, girl, you got this. All day long. She said, it didn't matter how tired you were. Every time you got knocked down, you got back up. She said, I played on the very first women's Olympic team. And I'm taking 10 American women to play against the Mexican Olympic team. Are you interested in being our player captain? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, what she didn't know is that I speak Spanish, and so I became the player captain translator for the American team. And on my 30th birthday, we played our first game against the Olympic team. And at halftime, because I could speak Spanish fluently, they let me share my story in front of about 5,000 fans. And at the end of my story, all 5,000 stood up and sang happy birthday. And at the end of the game, about 100 little kids lined up on the sidelines and they wanted me to sign their shoes and their socks and their T-shirts. Miss Erin, thank you so much for coming to our country and sharing your story and helping us believe that we can do better. And I knew in that moment, as much as I love basketball, I love young people so much more. And I would come back on the plane to America, and my cousin, who's in the picture with me, the big guy, that's Bill, Bill would call me about two weeks after I got home. And he said, Aaron, I'm coaching this girls' basketball camp in northern Minnesota. I need you to come and coach with me. My girls have never met anyone like you. They've never met anyone who even tried out for the WNBA. Would you come coach? And I said, Bill, I think you live in the same small town where grandma lives. You know the grandma I hadn't spoken to. And I said, I will only come to Minnesota if you arrange for me to talk to her. He's like, are you sure? I said, oh, I'm very sure. And I would fly to Minnesota. I made the front page of the newspaper, black lady in town to coach basketball camp. <laughs> I still have that newspaper somewhere. And I coached camp, and he drops me off at her home. She lived in a retirement home at the time. My grandfather had already passed away. And to make a really long story short, she would invite me into her home. She was about four foot 11, so just physically, imagine physically what that would look like. Um, she would put a shoebox in front of me. And do you know that all those years, my mom had been sending her my school pictures? Every certificate I ever won, every newspaper clipping I was ever in was in this shoebox. And my grandmother, through tears, said, Erin, do you know, out of the 18 grandchildren, you were always our favorite. We just didn't know how to tell you we loved you because you're a nigger. Can't use that word, Grandma. <laughs> That's not a nice word. She said, well, what do I call you then? I had a revelation that day. 
I believe there are so many more ignorant people out there than there are racist people out there. And if my grandma, you can clap for that, you can clap for that. If my grandma could call me the N-word, but also call me her favorite, did she actually hate me or did she just not understand me? She didn't understand me. And she would follow with these words, Aaron, can you ever forgive us? Your grandfather went to his grave and he never got to tell you how much he loves you. Why do I do this work? Because I've watched the lack of this work destroy my family. And I refuse when I have the opportunity to let it destroy other people's family. Here's me in Holland that year at nine years old. This was the year that would transform me. I would get to meet Anwar Sadat's wife this year, the president of Egypt. And she would tell this little nine-year-old black girl, Erin, you are a world changer. Not you're going to be. You are a world changer. Nine years old. This once orphan kid would end up in a space with Mrs. Sadat at nine years old. And I took those words seriously, and I began to live a life wanting to be a world changer. It led me to Bryn Mawr College right outside of Philadelphia. And for those of you who don't know Bryn Mawr, it's a sister school to Princeton. I actually got accepted at Princeton, but Princeton never looked at my financial aid paperwork to see that I was a teacher's kid. They just looked at the name of my high school and assumed I must be one of the rich kids at the private school. I wasn't. I graduated with a 3.9 GPA, triple varsity athlete, captain of all three, played two instruments in the band, and ran the largest security council for a model United Nations in the world, and Princeton gave me a $1,000 scholarship. So Bryn Mawr would give me a big scholarship, and I would come to America sight unseen. By the way, Bryn Mawr at the time had a sign not a mile from my college campus in 1989 that said, Bryn Mawr Cricket Club, no coloreds or Jews allowed here. And by the way, that sign didn't come down until 2012. That was my welcome to America at 18. I almost committed suicide in my freshman year of college. I was called the N-word so many times that I stopped counting. When I asked my dean if I could major in English, French, and Spanish, she said, you? Are you sure? I think you should just pick one. And at the time, I didn't have the confidence I have today because today I would say, you know, I speak four. I'm just picking three. <laughs> I didn't have that kind of confidence then. And so I allowed that to begin to erode at my self-esteem. And by the end of basketball season, I was ready to commit suicide. But it was one day, after being at my lowest point, I just went for a walk one day. And I ended up on a basketball court with a guy named Dr. Julius Irving. I had no idea who he was. But he had built a basketball court right in, in the area where the hope lived, where the black families lived. He worked in the rich white people's homes. And I got to play basketball with him that day and his sons and some of their friends. And when he was gone, I sat with three of his, his young men, his boys' friends, and they all shared with me that they dropped out of high school because high school for black boys in Philly was horrible. Not enough chairs, not enough books, more security guards than counselors. And I remember asking these three boys, so... What's your dream for the future? And each boy said, Aaron, we don't expect to live to be 21. Why would we dream? That was the day I became a teacher. I would walk all the way back to my dorm that day, call my parents collect, and say, I never realized you all were world changers. But I know it today, and guess what? I'm not coming home. I'm going to stay in America, and I'm going to become part of the solution. And that was 30 years ago. Oh, sorry. And this is my family today. So proud of my kids. Um, my youngest son just started graduate school at USC with Steven Spielberg. I'm one of 15 students. Izzy would go on to get one wrong on the SAT. Um, my other son, Malachi, coaches high school football with my husband. And Renika, if you all know Logan, Logan, I need you to stand up, because Logan is my daughter's best friend. And he's pretty fabulous. Um, but it's funny because I'm speaking at Logan's conference today, but I just spoke at my daughter's conference. She works for the Equity and Education Coalition. She's the little girl who lost her mom. By the way, her mom would overdose and die when she was nine. Her dad just got out of prison after 27 years. Um, 
pretty proud of my kids. Skip ahead. I'm almost done here. I want to share, these are uh, three other reasons that I do what I do. These are all my former kids who are now teachers. And in fact, um, Jordan Keller, if you're in Tacoma Public Schools, um, he was my first kid in my very first substitute teaching class. He's the kid I just got to go see doing his admin internship at Stewart Middle School. He was a knucklehead as a sixth grade kid, like the biggest knucklehead I've ever had. But he ended up getting a scholarship to Whitworth University while I was at Whitworth. And he calls me um, right before school starts and said, Ms. Jones, I don't know if you remember me. I'm like, oh, yes, I remember you. And he said, I know, I'm sorry, Ms. Jones. I, I was such a knucklehead in, in middle school. He said, but I'm going to become a teacher just like you. He would follow me to Olympia after I won the Milken Educator of the Year Award and started working at OSPI. He did a year in internship and in the legislature. We played basketball in a basketball league together. Um, I moved to Federal Way to be an administrator. He was a teacher in Federal Way. And then two years ago, he called and said, Ms. Jones, I'm ready to come home. Can you find me a job in Tacoma? And I was able to find him a job in Tacoma, and now he's doing his admin credentials. This is why we do the work we do. Some of the other kids that I've had the opportunity to connect with. As you know, I have run for office. I'm the first black woman to run statewide for anything, any statewide office. Changed my life. Changed my life. I have no regrets at all. I'm never running again for anything. Um, <laughs> but I have no regrets. And it's led me to working with, I get to speak to 150,000 kids a year because of that. And I'm um, just really thankful for all the people that I get to meet. Um, I told you I'm now a runner. But I want to end with this picture. And there's a special human that's in this room that I didn't even know was going to be here. So um, Mike, is, Mike, would you stand up? Because I didn't even know you were going to be here. This is, anyway, he's not going to, he's embarrassed, but there, this is Mike, and he's in the picture right here. I didn't even know he was going to be here today, but he is a new friend of mine, he and his wife, um, and I just want to acknowledge that the picture was here before I knew he was going to be here. And then these are two of my students who I got to run into this summer who are now in education, and I think about my why. My why is to become the best version of me and then to help the young people whose lives I get to touch become the best versions of them. And that's what this equity work is all about. How do we create space for everyone to become their best self? If you want to know more about that, if you want to get into the details of what that means for you as systems leaders, please come to my session later. Thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you for running for office. If I can help you in any way, I'm not running again, but I can help you. Um, <laughs> Thank you for what you do and for all you invest in young people and in the staff that serve those young people.